So first off, thank you. Appreciate yes. this. Um, we're going to start with COVID-19. And, and just during the height of COVID-19, you guys are really making policy for the state. The two biggest cities in Oklahoma were really dictating what the rest of the state was doing in, in a lot of ways. How did that go down between you two? Could you tell us about the conversations you had and how were you able to make policy together? Well, you know, if you go back even before that, we obviously had decided to set a different tone for the state in that Oklahoma City and Tulsa would be friends and we would try to you know, establish that at our level in a way that maybe it had never been before. And, and that's, we talked to Channel 6 and Channel 9 in that same vein, you know, several times. But I think we never knew how it would substantively manifest itself. It seemed like it was mostly symbolism to that point. And then COVID-19 comes, and I think we realized pretty quickly um, that we would probably have to coordinate that, you know, if the, if the state had come in immediately with, with various mitigating factors, you know, we, we probably wouldn't have been put in that same position. And in other states, that's sometimes what happened. But here, that wasn't coming, at least in the earliest days. And so we were starting to communicate. I mean, if you can remember, March 11th is a big milestone in Oklahoma City, but really around the country when the Thunder game gets canceled. I would say, um, you know, we were probably talking from that point forward, you know, every day, if not every few hours, under the idea that if either of us did something, right, whether it be closing bars and restaurants or, or whatever it is, um, and the other one's not doing it, it would be something both of us would have to defend, you know? <laughs> I mean, we, we represent collectively metro areas that account for, you know, over half the state's population, if not two-thirds. I mean, if you count the whole metro, right? And so what Tulsa does obviously kind of influences and impacts this whole metropolitan area. What Oklahoma City does impacts and influences 1.4 million people there. Well, collectively, that ends up being half to two thirds of the state's population. So it's a long jump to third, right? Biggest city. So the first two cities do have a lot of influence uh, in something like that. And it just felt like from the very beginning, if I closed bars and restaurants and he didn't, I would be asked, why am I doing that when Tulsa's not? And he would be asked, why is he not doing it when Oklahoma City is? And we should do things in conjunction with each other and maybe even time it to the hour, you know, uh, certainly to the day. But we ultimately got to that point when we both asked our residents to shelter in place. We did time it down to like 12 o'clock on a Saturday. Let's do it at the exact, let's announce it to our residents at the exact same time. That coordination started about March 11th and just continued really every day for what seemed like a, a very long time. It was probably only um, six weeks or so really at that level. But you know, that was six weeks. It felt like a decade for most of us. Same question. Your, your thoughts on, on kind of what you learned in doing that and and how do you think that could help you move forward as two cities? Well, I think Merrill's exactly right. In when we came in, we have been friends for 20 years. Uh, our families are friends. Our kids are about the same age. Every chance that we have to get together, uh, we do it. But I think early on, it was more about resetting the tone of the relationship between the cities away from this sort of stupid sibling rivalry and instead finding ways that we can support each other and by extension help Oklahoma grow in the process. I don't think either of us ever expected that we would be dealing with the greatest public health crisis either of our cities have ever had to face uh, and using that dynamic to help each other out. And so, I, you know, I can speak from, from myself in the early going of this pandemic the greatest challenge was learning, understanding, you know, how the virus is spread, what our testing capacity was, what our hospitals are dealing with, what our options are as a city uh, to help slow that spread and support our healthcare community and save lives. And it was a tremendous value to me to be able to call David just down the other end of the turnpike and know that we're both dealing with similar populations in the same state, just, you know, 100 miles apart, same regulatory environments and really getting hit with the same, about the same time. We both had the luxury of having friends who are mayors on the coastal United States that had been hit a few weeks before us, being able to see how they dealt with it, what worked, what didn't. But then from that point on, 
to, to be making life and death decisions that impact the city that you love, you want to do that in concert with the next city over, the, the other major metro area for our state, and know that we can tell people who are living in the most densely populated parts of Tulsa, or of Oklahoma, you're all, everybody that lives in our two major cities, you're gonna be under the same regulations. That we don't think that there's one thing that needs to be done in Tulsa that's not being done in Oklahoma City. And I really think that helped build confidence for people in both cities that, that knew that there wasn't one set of rules in one city and another set of rules in the other. And so he's right, I mean, we talked, especially, gosh, in the first four to six weeks, several times a day. You know, what are we hearing from other mayors around the country? What are we hearing from other mayors around the state? What's the state doing? What are our health departments doing? What's the state health department doing? Uh, what studies have come out? Because it was a constant learning process to learn as much as you can, as quickly as you can. And it was great to be able to go through that learning process and make those decisions working as a team. Uh, and I, I would say, I mean, as somebody who loves the history of our state, I don't think that Tulsa and Oklahoma City have ever worked more closely together than we did in the first two months of this pandemic. And we did it to save the lives of the folks who live in our communities. You think that consistency between the two cities was probably the best strategy that you could come up with on the fly at the time to help protect Oklahoma? Oh, there's no question in my mind because nobody knew everything about COVID-19 in the first two months of the pandemic and everybody was hearing different things you know that other cities around the country are doing or one message from the federal government different message from the state different messages from around the state and so i think it was very powerful for us to be able to say well we've talked with our local independent health departments here's what they're advising here's what we're going to do in the two largest cities in the state and everybody that lives in those two major cities and it did to his point it really migrated out into the broader metro areas from there, but you know that everybody that's in the areas with the greatest population density where this virus can spread the fastest, you're gonna be under the same set of rules. And I think that helped build confidence that these aren't just arbitrary decisions being made in a vacuum, but rather they're being made by a broader group of governments working together to set policy for our two largest cities in the state. And keep in mind that confidence is so important because everything we were doing was largely self-enforced. Yep. People, people who are good rule followers have always had a hard time understanding that, I think, in this <laughs> pandemic. But the reality is we can't enforce people wearing masks. We can't enforce even it was hard enough to enforce something even when it was limited to businesses because there's still hundreds, if not thousands of businesses in a community. It had to be something that the people bought into and they would be less likely to buy into it if the cities that are only 100 miles apart are doing different things. Well, I guess how much frustration was there from you two that there wasn't more at the state level? There wasn't more guidance at the state level, uh, something that might have more teeth that you could enforce. And, and instead it was, it was you two kind of coming up with your own plan. Well, I, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to remember all the details of this, but we maybe recall some of it better than others. You know, there were moments, well, first of all, governor and staff and it was always cordial and professional yeah there were times when we just felt like you know we can't wait any longer you guys might get there but like we got to do what we got to do for our communities and so we would do that but i would also remind you a lot of people think for example that that we closed all non-essential businesses that was actually governor stitt who did that i i had a press i think we both had press conferences scheduled to come out with with something that was kind of the next step in mitigation uh, uh, actions, and he called one and did it, you know. So I mean, it's not as if the state never did anything. The state definitely did some pretty dramatic things. That being the most uh, the most uh, memorable. Um, but yeah, we kind of had to, you know, we had to ultimately do things on our own at times. I wouldn't call it frustrating because. We did have the power in both our cities, even though we have different governments, we got different charters, everything. We both basically had similar authorities to do what had to be done. And so it didn't really bother me too much. It would have been more convenient in terms of the coordination with the suburban communities, obviously, to have it just come in from the state. But other than that, I always felt like I was like, look, we got the powers to do what we need to do. So, yeah, I mean, sure, maybe it might be easier if he'd do it all. but. Um, we got elected to, to these jobs and we asked for this responsibility and we have the authority to do what we need to do. So 
didn't bother me. Once we could kind of establish that that next mitigation uh, attempt was not coming from the state, then we just, okay, that's fine. We got it, but we're going to go do what we got to do to save our residents. And I would say, but kind of echoing that, I was always cognizant of the fact that the governor had a very different population that he had to be thinking about regulations for than we did. We represent the two most densely populated parts of the whole state. He was having to think about regulations that would apply to somebody who lives in you know, downtown Oklahoma City and somebody who lives out in the panhandle where there might be two people per square mile. And that's very hard to develop regulations in that kind of environment. So I, I thought it ended up, it worked the way, the system worked the way it was supposed to. We had the power to put in regulations that protected more densely populated areas. And then when he needed to step in and, and put the regulations in place, he did. I think, Mayor Bynum, you were a little more frustrated with some of the suburbs that, that you know, people feed in and out of the, the communities that are right outside of Tulsa to downtown to work and to back and forth to shop and that kind of thing. I, and to echo Mayor Holt's point, I mean, that is really the only area where I thought action by the state could have been helpful because... You know, we don't exist with a, a bubble around us. We are a metro area with, on any given day, a million people moving through here. And my ability to regulate was only the 400,000 people that live in the city limits. Uh, all the people that were coming in and out for business or whatever it might be, um, we didn't have the ability to regulate them. And so that definitely, that has impacted us throughout this. I mean, today. The, the majority of people who are in our hospitals in Tulsa aren't from Tulsa. Uh, they are unvaccinated people who live outside the city limits. So that has been a challenge throughout. If we could talk about the federal vaccine mandate and what that will look like in Oklahoma City and Tulsa, how much thought have you given that? And is are you thinking about situations where Oklahoma City and Tulsa may lose firefighters and police officers because they won't get vaccinated? and they won't test maybe weekly. Is this a situation where you're enforcing that at a city yes. level? Well, we have slightly different forms of government and it's gonna manifest itself on this question. I'm not as into that issue because I have no, you know, I'm barred from our charter from having any involvement in personnel. So things like that, that impact personnel, it's not that I uh, don't always know. In this case, I really haven't had any discussions about that. That's totally the city manager, but I bet GT does have to have an opinion. Oh yeah. And so we're still, our legal department is looking at whether or not these, because it's being done through OSHA, OSHA does not regulate public employees like we have at the city of Tulsa. And so our legal department is still awaiting guidance from the federal government on whether or not that mandate would even apply to our employees. Now, all that being said, about a month ago, I asked our legal department and our HR department and, and area healthcare professionals if we should do something like that for our employees. And the answer I got, it wasn't a, a philosophical objection, it was a practical one. They said, no, you should not do that because A, we have a test shortage in Tulsa already thanks to uh, people get, having allergies and symptoms from allergies that think that they have COVID and going and getting COVID tests and finding out that they don't. Uh, and so if all of a sudden you have 4,000 employees in the city or let alone the, the broader pub, uh, private sector employees that, you, that might fall under this federal requirement, you're going to have people who have no symptoms, who don't have COVID, taking up those test kits that are needed for people who actually might really have it. And so that was one pushback. The other, uh, and the main reason we didn't do it, was that it could lend a false sense of security. If somebody thinks, well, I just got tested on Monday, I'm negative, I can stroll around town without a mask on, uh, and I don't need to get vaccinated. And the only way, every doctor I talk to tells me, the only way we're gonna get out of this pandemic is for people to get vaccinated. Masks can help mitigate if people refuse to do it. Weekly tests can help if there's plenty of tests, if people refuse to do it. But the main way to end this, then the only way to end it, is through vaccination. And right now, 90% plus of the people who are in our hospitals with COVID are people who've refused to get vaccinated to date. Well, I just want to say, is, is there at least a frustration or just a fear, really a fear, that you might lose firefighters and police officers because they don't want to get, they just, they just quit or they, they take a leave? I just haven't, I haven't, I literally haven't had one conversation about the topic. I, I know that seems weird maybe, but like, again, we have different forms of government, so I don't, I, I, I haven't had time to process that. I mean, sure, we wouldn't want to lose anybody, but I, I don't, 
I don't know how much of a problem that would be. I mean, I would say as a community, you know, we're above the national average now. Been, we've been of a late bloomer, but we are now above the national average in first shot, you know, over 75%. So, like, I don't know how much pushback we would really get in Oklahoma City. And I, I know Tulsa's not quite at that level, but they're pretty high. You know, it's, it's, it's a little different here in the cities, maybe. It, the, the state drives this narrative that we're poorly vaccinated, but the reality is we're actually getting pretty well vaccinated in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. So I don't know that we would have a big issue, uh, you know, with our employees, but I guess we'll, time will tell. And we'll say we've tried the carrot approach rather than the stick with our employees. Uh, our city council approved a $250 stipend to every employee who turns in their vaccination card. Uh, and I found out this morning, we've already had 1,100 employees turn in those cards. I mean, they are very eager uh, to get that. And we hope that that incentivizes more of our city employees to go out and get that vaccine. And if they get 70% of their department, right? They, they get, get another, another $250 if 70% of their department gets it. So we're trying to base that team concept and get more people encouraged to get vaccinated. You know, as we see more of the Delta variant and, and other variants kind of show up and you've learned a lot, obviously, over the last year and a half, as far as leading the, the state's two largest cities, dealing with the pandemic. Where are we at right now? As, as Where are these two cities at right now? And where do we go from this point on? Well, I think Mayor Holt makes a great point. OKC is right above 75% vaccination, or at least first shot. Here in Tulsa, we're a little over 71%. Uh, we blatantly ripped off his graphics and uh, his release to promote that on Friday. Uh, we're pretty excited that both cities are leading the way in this regard. And, you know, the one thing I learned early in this pandemic, though, is not to try and make long term predictions. We have to just take this week by week and deal with it as it comes. I think both cities have done a really good job of that to date. And we're just going to have to keep plugging away, putting one foot in front of the other and encouraging more and more people to get vaccinated. And as more and more people do, we'll close that gap and eventually snuff this thing out. So in June and July, we had in Oklahoma City Metro about 15 new cases per day, if you can believe it, at that time period. Whereas now in Oklahoma City, it's like, you know, six, seven hundred has kind of been our average of late. Um, I think it is very realistic to hope that we could get back to that level. Um, obviously, the vaccinations will help. And also, just honestly, the, 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 the variant just kind of working its way through. It's so contagious that it's kind of a it's kind of a fast mover, and that's unfortunate for some people. Um, but uh, I think we already see the cases plateauing, and my, my guess is as we reach October and November and that 75% one shot becomes 75% fully vaccinated, you'll see those numbers come back down. Now, all bets are off if there's ever a variant that you know the, the vaccine does not address. But this vaccine does address Delta variant very effectively. Um, and so I think we'll be okay as the fall emerges. And I think all the, the late blooming vaccination rates finally do what they're so good at doing. But we're always gonna have like this a little bit, I think. I mean, we're not uh, masters in public health, although we might, we might get an honorary degree. Uh, don't, don't, don't be afraid to sh uh, suggest that to people. I think we deserve it. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I think we, we follow a lot of the same stuff that everybody's reading. And, you know, it's not as if it's just going to be at zero anytime soon. You know, it's going to be something you kind of live with. But hopefully, um, if you're vaccinated, you will largely feel like it's not a factor in your life, knowing that even if you do catch it, like it's not, it's kind of like become like the common cold. But obviously that's not the reality we're in today, but I, I feel like that's a realistic place we could be in a month or two. If we could talk about this past summer with, with racial tensions in, in both the cities and lessons learned as mayors, uh, what, what was learned? We, 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 saw, we saw riots in Oklahoma City and uh, you know, what was learned by, by you and your office about easing, easing racial, racial tensions? Right. Say, say uh, so many. Well, just <laughs> lessons learned from this past summer on I'm so what old helped now. I'm you actually guys. doing what my dad used to do. It's actually, it's actually helping. It's been a long time. <laughs> just, just what helped uh, for you guys, both of you in your two cities, this summer when we saw the, the racial tensions, we saw riots, we saw uh, a number of protests. Uh, what were the lessons learned this summer? Well, you know, there's so many uh, recurring themes between both of our 
times as mayor, and we both came into office talking about diversity and inclusion more so than I think anyone in our respective positions ever had. And he had his own uh, unique challenges to deal with with the Tulsa Race Massacre. But we had untold stories in Oklahoma City as well. And I, I used my time in office way before the murder of George Floyd to elevate our conversation about our civil rights movement and our, our sit-in movement and how it happened years before Greensboro. And, and we actually inspired them. And we need to talk about that. And ultimately, that uh, you know, led to the inclusion of the Claire Looper Civil Rights Center in MAPS 4 in December of 19. So a lot of that, it, it will be easy to think in the future that that was some sort of response to the summer of 2020, but that was approved. $25 million was approved in December of 19. So we were already having those conversations and we were already doing what I think white people who have grown up sometimes in our own bubbles were need to do and that is listening and not talking very much you know and i think what all i saw in the summer of 2020 was the recognition of that necessity expanding and more and more people being starting to listen and starting to recognize that we haven't all had the same deal you know and that's all that's what a mayor should ultimately care about is simply that everybody in the city have the same opportunity and i remember him early on saying something about you know, how it's unacceptable that the life expectancy and health outcomes, educational and economic attainment for people in North Tulsa was not the same as somebody who grew up, you know, just 10 miles away. And I basically just changed the names and, and stole his line in, for Oklahoma City um, because it's the same thing there. And, and that's, uh, that is unacceptable. That, that, is, that is not equal opportunity. We don't promise equal outcomes, but we should promise equal opportunity. That's the whole, that's the whole American dream, but it's not always realized. So. I think what I continued to feel validated by the summer of 2020 was to keep on that work. I felt like I had more friends now willing to walk that path with me. And, and now, our, I mean, our Chamber of Commerce, all the institutions of the city are so dedicated to that inclusion and diversity now. Um, and I just feel like uh, listening is still the most important thing. And, uh, and, and when, when there's a moment to talk, ask questions and, and just educate yourself and accept some things that maybe you just had never really thought through in the past. And I think in Oklahoma City, I see a real awakening that I also see in Tulsa amongst the whole city. There's always naysayers at both ends of the spectrum. It's too much or never fast enough. I get that. That's part of politics. But um, I find that in Oklahoma City, there's 70% of people in the middle who want to have that conversation and they want to build a better city for everybody. Same topic, Mayor Bynum. Uh, you know, it's been, a, it's been a big year in Tulsa, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, you know, the anniversary of the race massacre, um, that brought a lot of attention to the city on a national and worldwide perspective. What do you want the, the nation and the world to know about how Tulsa recognized that anniversary and that part of our history? Well, you know, I, I always remember the literally the moment I decided to run for mayor. It was in 2015 when I read that story that said that kids growing up in North Tulsa the predominantly African-American part of our city are expected to live 11 years less than kids elsewhere in the city. And uh, I know you know this, but for the viewers in OKC who might not know me so well, total policy nerd, uh, had spent at that point seven years on the city council and had never heard that statistic before. And so ran for mayor as much as anything to elevate that statistic, brought it up in every single speech I gave, and then when I was lucky enough to be elected, we developed the first comprehensive plan to address racial disparities in Tulsa's history, the Resilient Tulsa Strategy. We created the Mayor's Office of Resilience and Equity to follow through on that strategy. And then we became, and, and to date, I think we are the only major city in America that on its own publishes uh, an independent audit of inequalities in its city. We call it the Tulsa Equality Indicators to measure how we're doing on uh, closing those gaps. And I think that the, both what we saw last summer and, and then what we've also seen in the focus around the race massacre is an inflection point. It's an opportunity to elevate broader awareness around these issues. You know, we're doing a search right now for the graves of the victims of the Tulsa race massacre. Those are people who were murdered a hundred years ago, and yet it's fallen to this generation in our community to actually try and find them. Uh, no one bothered to do that for a hundred years. Now, on the one sense, that's, that's incredibly embarrassing and shameful 
about our city in its past. The trade-off is this generation of Tulsans is trying to do better. Uh, and it's not just Tulsans in one part of our city, because I've seen it. It's people in all who want this to be, we say, a city where every kid has an equal shot at a great life. Uh, and I completely agree with the point made about equality of opportunity. We just created, we took all of our old economic development authorities and merged them into one new authority, the Tulsa Authority for Economic Opportunity. And the, the purpose behind it is to help close that, that racial disparity gap in our city using economic development to create equality of opportunity here in our city. Let's talk about economic uh, opportunity. Um, how can the cities work together in the future, do you think, to attract more companies to locate in Tulsa or in Oklahoma City? And especially from some of these states that maybe their, their, their state governments are a little more strict, uh, some of these companies can't get reopened. Are, are they primed to pick, so to speak, and bring to Oklahoma? You know, I think Governor Stitt has a pretty good line that uh, I laugh at every time I hear it, uh, which is that the governor of California is our Oklahoma Economic Developer of the Year. Uh, he gets the award for creating the kind of environment that is really pushing a lot of folks to look at Tulsa and Oklahoma City in ways that they haven't before. I'll tell you, that has been uh, one of the real silver linings of the pandemic for me is it has shown me how strong the interest is in our economies here in Oklahoma that throughout the pandemic, uh, when the national economy is in a recession, when there is, you know, there are unprecedented challenges around doing business, and especially on our historic sectors here in Tulsa of aerospace and energy, yet the interest in business of locating, growing, relocating here, or growing ex existing facilities here never slowed down throughout the pandemic. Uh, you know, we have Elon Musk flying into Tulsa in the middle of the pandemic to look at potential sites here. And I can tell you, since he came here, we came in second place to Austin, but we have had a massive surge of electric vehicle companies who are now interested in Tulsa, where we were not on their radar at all before Tesla started looking at Tulsa. And so I think one of the things that Mayor Holt and I have tried to do in our times in this job is create cities that are attractive for companies that are looking at locating in Oklahoma. And we have this, I think, incorrect mindset that like Tulsa and Oklahoma City are so far apart. And oh my gosh, it's, you know, it takes an hour and a half if you're driving the speed limit to get from one to the other. That's like a short commute for people who are used to living on the coasts. And so I, I can tell you there have been economic prospects where we were both competing. Uh, and I can think of one in particular that we didn't make it to the next round, but OKC did. I called up that CEO the next day and told them why they needed to go to Oklahoma City. What a great place it would be for them to locate. And the things that they're doing in Oklahoma City, they help us recruit business here in Tulsa. And I think vice versa. Uh, by having two cities that are so close together, uh, building and, and going through this real resurgence in the last five to ten years, it makes both of us more competitive in the international economic development playing field that exists right now. So, are you okay with poaching as well? <laughs> I don't know. Could we all pause and look over here? <laughs> I'm glad you positioned Marihol to look directly at the WPX tower under construction. It's a beautiful building. Still under construction. It is, it is going to be Not a man. beautiful building. It's it's going to be, be brand great, new. Great facility. Great opportunity I'm there. sure there are a lot of Oklahoma City companies looking to expand. We've got space for them here. Um, Fortunately, I don't feel like we often compete directly. When we do, we do it like gentlemen. And, and that, was, that was an amazing comment that he just made. I don't even know that I knew that story, that he called someone and, and encouraged them to look at Oklahoma City. So I appreciate it. Most of the time, as he said, it's synergy and, and we can hopefully benefit each other. And as he said, I mean, 90 minutes is like the subway commute from Hoboken to the Upper East Side, right? I mean, like that is not that much distance. That's certainly 
won uh, the NBA over back in 2008 when we were trying to convince them to relocate the, the Thunder to Oklahoma City. It was like, look, don't just look at Oklahoma City's market for, for an amenity like that. Look at you know Oklahoma City and Tulsa. It's just 90 minutes away. And so I, I think, yeah, I think we can be mutually beneficial. And we also, I think, inspire each other. I mean, I think we've both borrowed things from the other through the years to improve our quality of life, which has really been the secret sauce. I mean, sure, tax policy, regulatory policy, workers' comp reform, I mean, those things obviously do matter to companies, but I don't think any of those things would have been enough if our two cities had not invested in themselves over the last 20, 30 years to build a city that people want to live in. There's just there's just so much you can uh, enjoy after 5 o'clock about workers' compensation reform, you know? You really need... <laughs> You really would rather have concerts and a sports team and, and great restaurants and a great ballet, you know, and, and that's what our cities have really demonstrated, I think. And that's why one of the reasons why we're seeing so much economic activity. Oklahoma City, second lowest unemployment in the country, five straight months of record sales tax. And of course, one of the fastest growing large cities, now 22nd largest in the United States. That's all validation that our economy is booming, but we trace that directly back to our investments in just building a better place to live. Well, how much does it help when, when you'll start something over here and then, or, or vice versa, and then OKC picks it up like uh, a better way? It's a new, we, so that announcement just came out like about a month ago in Oklahoma City. And you guys have been doing it for a couple of years. So how often does that happen where, hey, you know what, you, maybe you call him and say, we got this thing, it's working pretty well, you guys want to take a look at this, and, and vice versa? Well, I will say, first of all, the fundamental premise of our economic development strategy here in Tulsa is inspired by what we've seen in Oklahoma City over the last 15, 20 years. I mean, I think, and I want to give them all the credit in the world, in Oklahoma City, the, the leadership in the community woke up to the fact that economic development and growth is now national and international. It isn't cities fighting with their suburbs for shopping centers. And that, that's the other main reason that I ran for mayor in 2016 was I felt like we were obsessed with beating you know, our, our neighbors out for a sporting goods store while they're out competing to bring major national employers to town and seeing cities around the world that are able to grow because they have that mindset of working regionally to compete nationally and internationally. And so when, when my administration began, we ended the, the local fights and we started working together as a region to build the kind of city that could bring the best employers and employees to Tulsa. And in the last five years, we've landed the two largest new employers in the history of the city and the single largest economic development investment in the history of our city. And I don't think that's a fluke. That is because, like Oklahoma City's done for the last 15 years or so, we've had our focus on the right playing field for the last five years instead of this destructive navel gazing that we were doing previously. And so I think we've borrowed that, definitely, that strategy from OKC. And anytime I'm giving speeches around town and people bring up Bricktown or the Thunder or, you know, the amazing things that they're doing to build quality of life, I always point out that those are elements of a larger strategy to make Oklahoma City nationally and globally competitive. And we need to do the same here in Tulsa. And people totally get it. On Better Way, I was so excited to see that adopted in Oklahoma City. That was one of the first initiatives I launched when I became mayor, we were actually, I think, the second city in the country to do it uh, after seeing Albuquerque tested out. We did it as a pilot project here. And in our first year, we found that our data was almost exactly the same as Albuquerque's, which has inspired a lot of other cities around the country to now adopt that program. Uh, and it gets people off of the street into productive work and most importantly, into the social service pipeline where they can get the help they need. Uh, and so I, I love the fact that Tulsa and Oklahoma City are finding ways to innovate, help people get a hand up and, and lead a better life. Cities and states are laboratories of democracy, as they say, and we get to have a laboratory that's just 90 minutes away. And I love to, I would say, pick up the Tulsa world, but they don't deliver the papers between the cities anymore. But, you know, go to... <laughs> Go to the websites of, of the Griffin companies or go to the websites of the different newspapers and it is like reading a kind of slightly alternative universe, you know. It's like, oh yeah, he's kind of doing, you know, dealing with the same challenge I am, just, to, you know, a slightly different time frame, uh, slightly different perspective. But it really is instructive and that's obviously been one of the strengths of our relationship and I think the, that all the leaders in the two cities are more and more looking to the other ones to kind of 
see what they're doing there. And hopefully it's all kind of a positive push, you know, not like a negative competition, but more of like a kind of, oh, that's cool. We should we should do that. So, yeah, we certainly were inspired by A Better Way Success in Tulsa. I remember early on uh, in your tenure, you were pushing a detox center for Tulsa yeah, and you would hold up the fact that uh, that Oklahoma City had had one and we yep. had for like 20 or 30 years. Yep. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, so it's not just about economic development or, or sports teams. It's like little things here and there. Um, that we get to check out in each other's cities and, and when one tries it first then the other one gets to sit back and see if it works or not. And that's great. I mean, uh, that's why I love going to other cities, love going to mayor's conferences, I mean, for all those reasons. But here we have one that's most, um, you know, most relevant because we're in the same state. We kind of have the same people, same political culture, same state laws. I mean, you can really see whether something's going to work in your community or not. I'm interested, you know, it's been a long year and a half, so to speak, for, for all of us. It's been, it's been difficult. It's been challenging. Um, you know, we're all worried about what's next. We're worried about our kids, our families. Um, do you two, I'm interested to know, do you have any, any predictions as we get kind of closer toward the end of this, this year? And what are your goals for your two cities as we get closer to the end of the year? Um, you know, I think job one for us is to continue to navigate this pandemic. Um, and, you know, the nature of that has evolved. And, and this is another area where David and I talked and recognized that after the first six to eight weeks of the pandemic, we really needed to shift gears, that this was not something that was going to flare up and be over pretty quickly. And so we needed to shift gears and move it more towards the, the regular legislative process. Uh, and have both of our city councils more engaged and involved in the ongoing uh, COVID response. And so I think you'll continue to see that. Uh, we will continue to go through cycles of this. I think he's exactly what we're trying to do with our vaccination rates is mitigate the worst outcomes of this virus, uh, which is people ending up in the hospital and, and potentially dying. And the vaccine does prevent that almost entirely. Uh, and so we wanna to continue to push that and see higher and higher levels. I love the fact that our cities are so close to one another in our overall levels of the first dose. Would love to see some friendly competition on that front, try to catch up. Uh, we also, I think we will both be looking, we have the American Rescue Plan that was put in place. I know we are looking very stringently at how we will utilize those dollars to help and then put them to the greatest potential impact here in Tulsa. I'm sure that they're doing the same in OKC. And then this mutual work that we can do together to continue to grow our economies, uh, that is something that if you're growing the wealth in your community, that solves a lot of other problems. I mean, that has a big impact on crime rates, that has a big impact on health and education and everything else if you're growing your economy. I think you're going to continue to see us work together on that. Uh, and then I look forward to seeing Mayor Holt win re-election by the largest margin in the history of Oklahoma City. Just want to put the bar at that level. <laughs> so we're setting the bar at that level for him. At least that's the expectation from us watching from afar here in Tulsa. This guy had to go through a re-election in the midst of that crazy year. You know, yes. that was, that was. Uh... Yeah, my hairline used to be like way up here. <laughs> He was really, I think, the first large city mayor to face re-election, like, after all that. You know? yep. <laughs> yeah, good times. <laughs> what do you want? That's right. Um, well, uh, I see Oklahoma City continuing to grow. You know, population is kind of like the ultimate judge. You know, people vote with their feet. We are one of only 14 cities in the United States to add over 100,000 people over the last decade. I, I do not see that abating based on just anecdotal evidence of, of home sales and everything else. It seems like we're benefiting a lot from, from coastal people moving in. And what I'm seeing more than I ever did before, we used to want people to stay. That was our, like, graduate from college, but stay. That was our first goal. Then it was, come back. You grew up here. You went somewhere else, but we're worthy of you now. But the thing that I am, I'm meeting more and more people, it, it's almost something I never even expected or hoped for who have no connection to Oklahoma, who have chosen to, to Oklahoma City, in my case, I'm sure Tulsa has their own stories. Yep. Um, just just because it looked like it was pretty cool, worthy of them, good place to, to, to build their life. And I'm like, your parents don't live here, you didn't go to high school here. Nope, 
you know, just like did some research and decided this was where to go. Well, I think that's, you know, Oklahoma City and Tulsa, I think, can be like kind of the next great Texas cities. I mean, you know, like it's kind of happened in Texas over the last 20 years and they're all sort of saturated, right? Now it's like nobody wants to live in Austin and the traffic's too bad, you know? And I think they're starting to look a little broader and they're looking just a little bit to the north. And people like that who filled all those cities are now going to start filling Oklahoma City and Tulsa. And so I think a lot of growth over the next 10 years, I tell people in Oklahoma City, I'm like, I know it seems like we've come so far. I'm telling you, I really think that that was just the foundation and that now we kind of get the payoff of that. And I think we're seeing that in that incredible population growth that we saw uh, over the last decade. Yeah. I, I'm just really quick, um, I just want to ask about Biden's infrastructure plan. And if there is a project that each you have in mind for like, you know what, maybe we could get this out of that. Is, is there something in near Oklahoma City that you would like to see done with, with those dollars? I know that you've been yeah. huge on infrastructure. So to, so to remind you and your audience like kind of where all that is. So there's a $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure proposal. That got 69 votes in the Senate. Lots of, that's truly bipartisan. That wasn't token bipartisanship. It's now in the House. There's other stuff that is also dubbed infrastructure that will not have the same bipartisan support. But it's the first one that I and almost 400 mayors are supporting. It has you know, a lot of the stuff you typically associate with core infrastructure, roads and bridges, transit, um, passenger rail, interestingly, and I'll, I'll return to that, uh, water infrastructure, broadband. I think for Oklahoma City, when I look at that, when I look at those priorities, I think, you know, where are we most efficient? It's, it's transit. Like Tulsa, we were built around the automobile, um, and people want to see a little bit shift, a little bit of a shift in focus now. And so you're seeing both communities. They opened their first bus rapid transit line. We uh, are going to have ours open in the next couple of years, and then we have more funded in Maps 4. But that's the kind of thing that we would love to turn to a bigger pot of federal transit dollars to, to accelerate and grow and do more with public transit. And the other thing, and regrettably, it's not a proposal that grabs Tulsa, but passenger rail uh, you know, is something that this package proposes to invest in more than really in American history to this point, which is no surprise. The president's well known to be a big Amtrak fan. Well, Amtrak has proposed connecting Oklahoma City up to Kansas um, so that we kind of can connect through that whole northern network. Right now, we have the Heartland Flyer, which only takes you to Fort Worth, and that's doesn't feel like the direction you want to go if you're trying to get to Chicago or, or the Northeast or to the Northwest. So that would be great. We'll see. That's a, you know, a multi-year idea, um, but, but this package proposes to fund that, and Amtrak has specifically said that's one of the projects that is on their priority list. So uh, we'll see how all that goes. I, I, I don't make the decisions that like that. You know, I wish that Tulsa could get linked up with all of that. Um, I don't know when or if that'll happen, but obviously the first priority is for us to get better connections somewhere, and in this case, it would be to Kansas. So that's one of, that and public transit are the two things I think about with that bipartisan infrastructure package. So, so two years ago when we did this with you two, light rail came up, and the idea that we'd have, we'd have rail connect the two cities. We're, we're not any closer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's a, that had to be a state initiative, and that would cost, I mean, I don't want to sugarcoat this, that would cost billions of dollars to have, like, high-speed rail. I'm sure it would be less than that to have just standard rail, but even still, it would be hundreds of millions. And I mean, it, that's that's just kind of the kind of priority the state would really have to take on for, for that to ever happen. And maybe someday that visionary will come forward to governor or speaker or Senate pro tem, because you'd probably have to come at that level, you know, somebody saying, this is the thing I really want to make happen in my time. Um, and I'm sure we'd be all for it, but people come to us and want us to fund it. And we're like, you know, that we don't have the resources that we need to provide transit to our community first before we can try to for we would build a line you know to, to cross 90 miles of oklahoma that's a state thing you know so um i think i know we're both focused on better public transit and i didn't mention this but it would certainly be a beneficiary we hope would be our first the state's first regional transit authority has been formed in oklahoma city between six communities there and uh, governor henry is the chair of it and that's a that is a new level of government in oklahoma city that will come to the voters in the years ahead and, and present a plan. Uh, but it would be great if, if something like the bipartisan infrastructure package could give that a jump start. I don't know what the regional transit conversation is like here in, in Tulsa, but that's where we are there. So there's a lot of movement in transit in Oklahoma City. Um, and we're going to do, you know, we're used to doing things on our own, and we'll do that if we have to. But obviously, federal support would be awesome.
I think here in Tulsa, our, our big infrastructure needs are around transportation infrastructure. I mean, our number two, and it's very close, our number two industry is aerospace. Uh, and most of that industry in the aviation industry that goes in and out of Tulsa International Airport is relying on a tower that was built in the 1950s that had a 30-year lifespan. <laughs> so if you're doing the math, it's about 40 years past due on replacement. Um, and we've been fighting with the FAA for years on getting that replaced. Would love to see this solve that problem. Now I think the other big one for us is that we have the McClellan Kerr Arkansas River Navigational System here that leads to the, the nation's largest ice-free inland port at the Port of Catoosa. Most of the nation's uh, energy, energy exports and grain and agricultural exports for this part of the whole country go through that navigational system. And it is in dire need and has been for decades of deepening and dredging. And this is one of those things where the federal government has talked about it for years, decades now. I mean, I started working on it as a staffer for Senator Nichols 20 years ago, and goodness knows how long before that it was being worked on. This is an opportunity to actually fund the work, and by deepening those channels, that would have a massive economic development impact on this whole part of Oklahoma uh, from an industrial and energy construction standpoint. So we would love to see that funded in there too. Well, you talk about recruiting businesses to relocate or open up here. Shipping is a huge consideration for them. Oh yeah, no, uh, logistics is a huge asset for us in recruiting businesses here. Uh, having that port, that navigational system, right adjacent to our airport rail line and the highway infrastructure that we have here. All of those things are, are huge assets for us when we're recruiting companies here to Tulsa. You know, I, I did want to ask you, and I know you've talked to us previously in interviews about this, about, you know, the populate, the census population data has come out and it shows our metro area right at about a million people. Yeah. And uh, explain to us and talk a little bit more about how that opens doors to economic development. Well, first, I think the way it's growing is fascinating. Um, you know, Tulsa has really been through three big waves of growth in our history. It's 20s and 30s when we became a city, when, you know, a lot of the buildings you see behind me were built. In the 60s and the 70s, when we became a metro area connected with our suburbs in a way that we weren't before. Right now, we are becoming a global city. Um, our immigrant community, and in particular the Hispanic community, is driving a tremendous amount of our growth here in Tulsa. Being over, crossing that threshold into a million people, there are a lot of companies because they, when they're looking at the workforce that they need to draw from, major employers, they don't even look at you if you're not over a million. Probably most famously, Amazon going through the HQ2 process. Uh, if you weren't over a million, they didn't even look at your application. We submitted one anyway, uh, but they wouldn't even look at it because they need to know what size of a workforce they can draw from in your region. So us crossing that threshold opens us up to all sorts of uh, employer opportunities, but also retail opportunities with major national retailers that all of a sudden start taking you a lot more seriously when you cross that threshold. That was a big win for us and very similar to what they're seeing in Oklahoma City. Our growth is coming from people, not necessarily who are coming back, though we've had that, uh, or from just retaining people who are already here, but there is the, the opportunity that exists right now in Tulsa is very exciting for people. As I like to tell folks, there are billionaire philanthropists around the world that would love the opportunity to shape a city that a young professional has in Tulsa right now. Uh, the opportunity to play a leadership role in shaping a community for the next generation, it exists in Tulsa and in Oklahoma City right now in ways that just don't exist in other cities around the country. And I think that's one of our big draws for people and the particular dynamic, the type of people that we're attracting to Tulsa are people that want to play a role in the community, want to help shape a community for the better. And I'm really excited to see what that's going to mean for us 25, 30 years down the road.